Evelyn, you teach at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and your specialty is in Confucianism. Could you say a word about uh, how Confucianism relates to contemporary environmental concerns? Well, Confucianism is a very rich ancient tradition, over 5,000 years old, and of course it has forms that play out in politics, and education, and society, and economics. But I think the heart of Confucianism as a spiritual and religious tradition is something that embeds the human in concentric circles. So relationality is, is key. And the relationality would be the human as part of a family, as part of society, educational world, political world, natural world, and the cosmos itself. This is one continuity of being, of relationality. So that's the beginning of an understanding of of their cosmology. Could you say a word more about the relationship of cosmology and Confucianism to environmental concerns? Well, maybe to draw out the cosmology a little bit more, um, the human completes these concentric circles in a particular way, um, because they have a notion of, of heaven as a guiding presence and force and power of earth as these dynamic processes of nature, ecosystems, and so on. But the human has this role of completing heaven and earth and the 10,000 things, this whole evolving process, if you will, by being the mind and heart of heaven and earth, the co-creators with this great fecundity. So ecologically, this has enormous implications. And cultivation plays a role then in, uh, in this nested uh, a concentric circles pattern. How does uh, cultivation, self-cultivation, activate this environmental concern? Well, the idea would be that you're cultivating yourself to increase harmony in the society and family and uh, the flourishing of the natural community as well. So earth community means human and nature working together. So as you cultivate yourself, which means learning, which means self-discipline, which means participating in the arts, um, this is a scholarly tradition. It's, it's a tradition where people wrote poems and exchanged poems to one another. Du Fu, one of the great poets of, of China, also had tremendous compassion for the suffering of people mm -hmm. reflected in, in his poetry. So self-cultivation has, has the arts, it has uh, literature, it has scholarship, but all of it is directed towards giving back to the society as a whole. I've heard you use the word anthropocosmic in dis discussing Confucianism. Does that relate uh, to this question of self-cultivation and cosmology also? Yes, uh, it's a word that Duwei Ming, a professor of Chinese philosophy for many years at Harvard and now back at Beijing University, has used. And he's trying to perhaps offset what the Western traditions are known for as being very human-centered, anthropocentric, and often just interested in the human-God relations. And Thomas Berry used to say, where are the human-Earth relations? And so this word anthropocosmic resituates the human, it decenters the human as over and against nature, resituates the human within these vast processes. Um, so it's, it's an exciting term, I think, and it's one that can perhaps add to our understanding of our role as co-creators with the universe. You've introduced us to Confucianism as a uh, ancient tradition with historical developments. Can you bring us into more 20th and 21st century developments, especially as Confucianism seems to have been lost in China? How has it come back? Yes, the revival of Confucianism is a fascinating and very complex story, and a lot of people are beginning to write on it. After what was called the May 4th Revolution in 1911, when a lot of scholars um, wanted to overthrow the imperial dynasty and say, we need a new fresh start, we need a republic, we need to move towards democracy, there was the sense, let's get rid of the past, let's get rid of Confucianism. And some of its more ideological and stultifying dimensions was... They said, let's clean this out. Let's bring in the West. Let's modernize. Let's bring in democracy. Huge, long struggle, of course, through the 20th century. 
But under Mao from 49 to 76, and particularly in the Cultural Revolution of 66 to 76, there was this effort again to wipe away the past and create a new energy around a political ideology, and it was a reformed Marxist version known as Maoism. And the Little Red Book and, and studying this as an ideology became important, and clearing out the intellectuals, and there was a tremendous amount of suffering, destruction of temples and intellectuals put to the countryside and so on. But in this destruction of a tradition, there was also preservation and revival going on. Against great odds, many of these scholars fled in 49 to Taiwan and to Hong Kong and set up at Taiwan National University, Hong Kong University, Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, programs in studying these texts and traditions and kept alive by a very thin thread but vibrant scholarly work and commitment to this legacy of 5,000 years of their history. Those books, those articles, those conferences are being appreciated now in China as many of the departments of philosophy are picking up on the need for something fresh from this Maoist Marxist uh, ideology. So there's a revival in the philosophy, academic world, there's a revival in the popular world, or one professor wrote a book on Confucianism, Confucius, that sold 10 million copies. And finally, there's a revival in what's being called ecological civilization, ecological culture. This is an ancient culture that takes culture very seriously. So they realize there's a gap in attitudes and views and values, even a worldview, for how are the Chinese going to deal with the immense and relentless and complex environmental problems of water, air, soil, crowded cities, cities of millions and millions of people. They're saying one of the ways is we need to have our own basis for an environmental ethics of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And the Harvard books that we did on those topics are, have been translated back into Chinese. So it's a vibrant and interesting and complex process. Mm, it's fascinating. We all know that China has become a major economic uh, power in the globe. Uh, could you say a word more about uh, the role of Confucianism in addressing the incredibly complex environmental problems that this industrial development in China. I know it relates to what you've just said, but I wanted to draw out your insights about Confucianism and its contemporary roles in the environmental crises in China. Yes, and some of these new Confucians, as they say in Taiwan and China, have been thinking about this as well. Mm -hmm. um, so their writings are beginning to respond to it. So I think it this tradition holds a very vibrant, dynamic, cosmological worldview where qi, matter energy, infuses the universe. We have qi, fish, plants, animals, trees, water, air, it's all filled with qi. And one of the things that the Taoist and Confucian tradition offer is the cultivation of qi in relation to the natural world. It also offers the sense that how can we be in alignment with these dynamic and changing patterns in nature? How can we set up sustainable agriculture that's attentive to complex ecosystems, attentive to appropriate irrigation, and so on? How can we also set up um, better government? The, the idea of humane government was very important in early Confucianism. Mencius said, unless the the emperor cared about the people. It wasn't a humane and fair government. And we need that kind of institutional backing up for environmental laws to be enforced and an environmental mindset to come forward in this ecological culture. Uh, finally, uh, could you say a word about Confucianism in the frame of the world religions? And by that I mean uh, many of the religions in the world today are very active in living traditions, and some people might s misunderstand and say, well, Confucianism doesn't seem to be a living tradition. It doesn't have rituals. So how would you respond to that question? Why is Confucianism at the table or at the discussion of world religions and ecology? 
Well, in fact, Confucianism, interestingly, does have a lot of rituals. It's very different, of course, than monotheistic Western Abrahamic traditions, God, human relations, salvation, redemption, being absolutely crucial. Um, so it, it expands our notion of what is religion, that's the first thing, and it also expands our notion of, of what is spirituality, what is ethics. There's a very inclusive and comprehensive ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, it provides a, a different model. A lot of young people are, are very intrigued by Confucianism for its appreciation of learning and scholarship, but contributing to a common good. So I think this tradition can and will make um, outstanding contribution mm -hmm. to the sense this is not about individual rights, but it's about responsibilities of the human to the flourishing of life for future generations. Mary Evelyn Tucker, thank you for this illuminating conversation. Thank you, John.